the thing that I want to know is that Joseph Warren, as I mentioned before, he was the founding father that America know, doesn't really know. This guy was quite a patriot. He was born in Massachusetts. He had graduated from Harvard University at the age of 28. He was very, very popular with the citizens of Boston. He was considered the most successful doctor in the city. And he was also a major advocate for the rights of the American colonists. He did not believe that what the, uh, what the government of Great Britain was doing was in the best interest of our country. And he's going to be a major contributor to the revolution, so to speak. Well, I'm going to give you four examples of why he was a major advocate of the rights of the American colonists. First of all, he was a very strong critic of British rule in the colonies. He was a very strong critic of British rule in the colonies. Which means that if you were a very strong critic of Sanford rules in the school, you would be outspoken and not, you'd be, out, you'd be outspoken about the cell phone policy and you'd be outspoken about the dress code and all these things because you would think that, you, you know, that his rule was too harsh. Number two, he spoke all over Boston about the rights of the colonists. He spoke all over Boston, went on speaking engagements all over the city, talking about the rights of the colonists and how the rights of the colonists were being violated by the British government. The third example that he was a major advocate of the rights of the American colonists is he would become one of America's most vocal agitators. He would become one of America's most vocal agitators. What's an agitator, Rachel? Um, you stir the pot, don't yeah. you? You stir the pot and you keep things going. So he, he would go around and, and, and agitate people or get people on the bandwagon. Okay, agitate is spelled A-G-I-T-A-T-O-R-S. A-G-I-T-A-T-O-R-S. And, and another example that he was a major advocate of the rights of the American colonists, who are the most radical col colonists right now? But, but there's a specific group. No, no, no. Sons of Liberty. And what he does with his being an advocate of the rights of the American colonists, he gains the full support of the most radical colonists in America, the Sons of Liberty. They become big supporters of him, the Sons of Liberty. So, some examples of why Do Dr. Joseph Warren was a major advocate of the rights of American colonists. Number one, he was a strong critic of British rule in the colonies. Number two, he would speak all across Boston about the rights of the colonists. Number three, he would become one of America's most vocal agitators. And those were people that were speaking out against the British government. And number four, he would gain full support of the most radical colonists, the Sons of Liberty. Okay? We'll talk more about him later, all the way up until his death, fighting for the cause. Okay? So, let's talk now about the Boston Massacre, because I know you guys have heard of that. But I just want you to know that uh, there was a person killed prior to the Boston Massacre because of feelings about the British government. Well... A lot of people don't know this, but one of the reasons why we had the Boston Massacre is because Christopher Sider's death really united the citizens of Boston against the British. Okay, Christopher Sider's death really united the citizens of Boston against the British. And remember, kids, in your mind that there were 4,000 British soldiers in Boston, one for each five citizens. Again, it'd be like having 80 police officers in, officers in here watching you kids. So, the ones that took the brunt of the frustrations of the citizens of Boston were the British soldiers. And within just a few days of Christopher Sider's death and funeral, the British soldiers were being constantly pelted with snowballs, usually filled with rocks, they threw homemade spears at him. They took clubs after him. The citizens of Boston were treating these British soldiers very violently. They were pelting them with snowballs filled with rocks. 
They were chucking homemade spears at them. They were trying to club them. And obviously this agitation was a constant and the friction was high between the colonists and the British soldiers. Okay, so these British citizens were taking out their frustrations of British rule and the death of Christopher Sider on British soldiers stationed in Boston, throwing rocks at them, throwing, excuse me, snowballs at them with rocks, throwing homemade spears, trying to club them, agitate them any way they could. So the relationship between the colonists in Boston and the British soldiers was not good. And finally, this friction is going to result in one of the most infamous events in American history. Infamous meaning not very popular. Who, uh, who said this will be a day that will live in infamy? Who said that? Who made that statement in 1941, December 8th? What? No, no, no. December 8, 1941. Franklin Roosevelt, after the Japanese bombing of Pearl Harbor, he said, he said, this will be a day that will live in infamy. Infamy means it's a day you'll remember, but it shouldn't be famous for anything positive. Well, this was probably the most infamous event in American history. And it occurred on March 5th, 1770. March 5th, 1770. And what happened is a large crowd of colonists gathered in Boston around the soldiers of the 29th British Regiment. On March 5th, 1770, a large crowd of colonists gathered in Boston around soldiers of the 29th British Regiment. What is a regiment? It's a group of soldiers, and they're usually numbered. 7th Cavalry was George Custer's unit, for example. 29th British Regiment, there were certain members of the Boston military that were, mem that were part of that 29th Regiment. There might have been a 27th Regiment. There might have been a 3rd Regiment. This happened to be soldiers that were assigned to the 29th British Regiment. And on March 5th, 1770, a large crowd of colonists gathered around them. Well, they began yelling insults. They started throwing snowballs. The guards were guarding a customs house. And what happened is these guards were at post at this customs house, and these American colonists came by, started throwing insults at them, calling them, you know, bloody backs and red coats and lobsters and throwing rocks at them and snowballs and just giving them a bad time. Now, what's a customs house? What are they guarding? Customs house. No? Good? No? Well, it could be, it could be contraband that they had collected, but basically it's where the, the, the customs house is where they collect the taxes and store the, the tax money, okay? Customs house, and, this, and, and Brian, it could have contraband in there, but it's where they collect taxes and store those types of things. Well, they're guarding that because they do not obviously want the colonists to get the goods inside there or the tax money. Well, the colonial mob just won't give up. They move closer and closer and closer to these armed British soldiers, and finally the order to fire is given. Okay? So they continue to move closer and closer and closer and harassing and insulting and threatening the British 29th Regiment, and finally they get too close and the order to fire is given. As a result, three colonists were killed by this fire and two others mortally wounded. Three were killed and two more were mortally wounded in this fire by the 29th British Regiment. Three colonists were killed and two others mortally wounded. Now, Elise, my dear, what does it mean if you are mortally wounded? And you eventually... Die. If you are mortally wounded, that means you weren't killed instantly, but you died of the wounds later. Mortally wounded means you did die. So there were five deaths as a result of the firing of the British 29th Regiment outside the Customs House in Boston on March 5th, 1770. Now the one that gets the most notoriety as being killed was a colonist by the name of Crispus Attucks. Crispus Attucks seems to get the most notoriety of those five colonists that were either killed or mortally wounded. 
Does anybody know why Crispus Attucks is mentioned? Did I? C R I S P U S. Is that the way I got on the ID sheet? Yeah. Oh, you spelled. Oh, you did. Okay. Yeah, Crispus Attucks. Anybody know why we mention him in history? He was a very good. He was a former slave who actually had escaped from his master 20 years earlier. So he had been a free slave, and we'll get into slavery later, for 20 years and was one of the five victims that were killed in this firing by the British 29th Regiment. So if you think about it, these five people, including Crispus Attucks, was among the first to die in the struggle over colonial freedom between Great Britain and the United States. Although it's not the United States yet, it's America, right? So, he's one of the first of five to die. Not officially in the Revolutionary War, but you put him right along with Christopher Seidel, put him right along with Crispus Attucks, and four others were among the first to die in the struggle over colonial freedom between Great Britain and the American colonies. Now, news of this shooting spread. The people of Boston went wild with anger. And how did this get called the Boston Massacre? Anybody know? I've oh, got that name. Go ahead. The newspapers over to Massachusetts to see what happened in the news. More people were hurt in the news. Kind of more of an intentional way to set up. Okay. Um, they may have. That they surely, they surely was in the paper. But the group that referred to the actions of the British soldiers as a massacre for the first time were Sons of Liberty. So the Sons of Liberty came out, which. Sully's right, end up getting to the media, but the Sons of Liberty came out and referred to the actions of the British soldiers on March 5th, 1770 as a massacre. Now, if you were the colonists of Massachusetts, what might you demand from the British government after the Boston Massacre? What might you want from them? What might you want? Who's withdrawing their troops? What is that? That's exactly right, Charles. They demanded that the British soldiers be withdrawn from Boston. Very good. They demanded that the British soldiers be withdrawn from Boston. What else might they believe to be appropriate? We got five deaths here, Josh. Money. Well, not money payments, but what did they want, Brian? They want, very pretty close, they wanted to have those British soldiers that fired put on trial for murder. Okay? So not only did they demand that the British soldiers be withdrawn from Boston, they demanded that the ones responsible for the death of Crispus Attucks and the four others be put on trial for murder. And they were. They were put on trial. Now, if you're put on trial for something, what's the first thing you better get yourself? A lawyer. A lawyer. Anybody want to guess who defended these British soldiers in this trial? What? No? No? You're getting close, though. Oh, right. He is. John Adams, who eventually will become the second president of the United States, was the lawyer that defended the British soldiers. So the British soldiers were defended by a patriot lawyer by the name of John Adams, who would later become second president of the United States. Now, these patriots in Boston thinking, hot dog, this will be an easy butt kicking, right, on these British soldiers. We'll take care of them. Well, John Adams didn't have any sympathy for these accused soldiers, but he was a lawyer, and he believed that every person was entitled to a fair trial, and he also believed that it was his duty to defend them professionally as he was paid to do. So even though he was a patriot, and most people would think that he would stack the deck, so to speak, against these British soldiers. He was very professional, and he believed that every person should be entitled to a fair trial, and he believed it was his professional responsibility to defend them as he would anyone else. 
Well, what would be Adam's defense for these soldiers? So what? So they shot in self-defense, self and that's the that's the route that Adams took in this deal, and he prevailed in this trial. In the end, Adams convinced the jury that the soldiers were acting in self-defense, and the defendants were found not guilty. And that's probably that was probably the correct decision. But it's ironic that someone that was such a patriot and is going to be the next, you know, the second president of the United States would defend so vehemently these British soldiers. But he did, because he thought it was right. Okay, any questions on the Boston Massacre? Okay, that'll take us to our next subtopic then, which is the repeal of the Townsend Acts. And Emily, what is the key thing to the Townsend Acts? What's got everybody ticked off about the Townsend Acts? The, the writs of assistance, or the search warrants. That's really the crux of the Townsend Acts. So we're going to talk about the British repeal of the Townsend Acts. Well, in 1770, Parliament gets another new Prime Minister, a fellow by the name of Lord Frederick North. So we've had George Grenville, Charles Townsend, and now Lord Frederick North becomes the new Prime Minister of Great Britain in 1770. Now, Think about this. Lord North assumes control of Parliament, and there's no doubt in his mind, he can see it pretty clear, that the gap between the American colonists and the British government is getting wider and wider and wider and wider. And his goal is to try to get something done to stop that widening and maybe even bring them back closer together. And so he urges Parliament to repeal these Townsend Acts these writs of assistance. And including in the Townsend Acts was still taxing, right, those goods that were coming in from Great Britain. So that's part of the deal. But the writs of assistance is what's got everybody upset. So the new Prime Minister urges Parliament to repeal the Townsend Acts. What was the main reason he really was doing that? It wasn't so much, it was to close the gap, but what was the main reason that he wanted those Townsend Acts repealed? It wasn't his name. No, think about think about how it might hurt Britain to keep them in. He didn't want to go to war. No. How did what? How did they how how did they get the stamp tax repealed? Oh, the non importation. The non importation agreements come into play again, and this becomes the main reason for repealing the Townsend Acts because the businesses in Britain were becoming ruined because of the lack of trade with the colonies. So although he did want to, you know, stop the widening between the colonists and the British government, the main reason why he pushed for the repeal of the Townsend Acts was because of, again, those non-importation agreements that was cutting trade off between the colonies and Britain. Well, not only did they repeal the, the Townsend Acts in 1770, they decided to let the Quartering Act expire. They didn't re-up that law. So the Parliament not only repeals the Townsend Acts in 1770, they also allow the Quartering Act of 1765 to expire, and so that law goes away also. Again, Townsend hoping that the repeal of these are going to help relations between the colonists and the British government. Now, for three years, relations got much better. So the repeal of the Townsend Acts and the allowing of the Quartering Act to expire did bring some temporary end to colonial unrest. Almost for nearly three years, they had, didn't have a lot of issues. Things were settling down a little bit. However, on June 9th of 1772, another conflict between colonists and Great Britain occurred. So they had some good relations for almost three years, but on June 9, 1772, we had another conflict between American colonists and Great Britain, which leads us to our next subtopic, Rachel, which is? Additional conflict between the colonists. Very good. Additional conflict between the colonists and Great Britain. We're going to have another issue happen here 
that's going to cause some tense feelings between the two groups. Additional conflict between colonists and Great Britain. Write something on the board for you while you get that down. Make sure I spell this. What happened on June 9, 1772 happened in Narragansett Bay, which is just off the coast of Rhode Island. So this additional conflict between the colonists and Great Britain occurred on June 9, 1772 in Narragansett Bay, which is off the coast of Rhode Island. This conflict was between a British commander by the name of William Dunningston, who was commanding a British vessel called the Gas Bay. Doesn't look like it says it's, that's how it's spelled, so Gas Bay. So a British commander by the name of William Dunningston was commanding a British vessel called the Gas Bay. What do you think, William Dunningston? and the crew of the Gas Bay were doing off the coast of Narragansett Bay, off Rhode Island on June 9, 1772. What do you think they were doing, Peyton? What was that? What was Dunningston and the, and the crew of the Gas Bay doing off the coast of Rhode Island in Narragansett Bay on June 9, 1772?